Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, good to see you all again. Um, I just want to say thank you to Alistair in particular for being here. He is the expert um, and also for the support from the Sheffield Museums and from the British Dragonfly Society for the event. So we really appreciate that. Dragonflies are really important, as Christine says. Um, they're quite a neat group because there are a relatively limited number of them. Um, so they, you, know, you can get to grips with most of the species you're likely to come across. There is a downside to that in that they are sneaky little so-and-sos and, -sos and they, you go, oh, a dragonfly. <laughs> and then it says, was the second abdominal thing yellow or green? <laughs> didn't notice. <laughs> so there are problems. If you are trying to record them, it's worth trying to photograph them if they come to settle. And after the presentation, you will have a good idea of approaches to the main groups, the damselflies and the dragonflies, and how to separate these out. So really interesting group. They are top predators. Prehistoric dragonflies, some of them were about 18 inches across. And I would love to have seen one of those. No, you wouldn't. They are. They were serious, <laughs> serious predators. So, you know, exciting beasts. They are eight, what we call apex predators within the invertebrate food chain. And also, to some extent, you know, they'll take small fish and things like that as well when they're larvae. So both in the water as larvae and the adults, they are serious carnivores. That makes some very good indicators for environmental quality. So you're not going to get dragonflies if the rest of the food chain isn't functioning. And we have a problem with the ponds at Worlow in that there is very little aquatic invertebrate life in them. There's very little aquatic vegetation underwater, not just the surface stuff or the emergent stuff around the edges. We know we're getting dragonflies looking at the pond, we've seen them, and we've seen some little damselflies as well, but what's going wrong in the water? This is important. The other way that, the, and you know, the dragonfly population may or may not give us information on that. And there are two things, there are dragonflies visiting the site, so we had broad-bodied chaser the other week when we were uh, in one of the meetings. Well, broad-bodied chaser will be investigating and they may, may take one look at your ponds and go, ooh, not for us. So we don't know. Um, so what you're really looking for are dragonflies egg laying or for the nymphs that Christine mentioned, which will be in the water below. And if you want to get some idea of what um, a vibrant ecological community looks like, go to the bottom of the Worlow playing fields where we're doing all this slowing the flow work creating the new ponds which are coming on incredibly well. So, you know, this is why we're interested. Now, there are things to help you, and I brought a few along. This shows how long it is since I really did uh, dragonflies in some detail. Dragonflies of Great Britain and Ireland, second edition, 1997. <clears throat> now, one of the things is with climate change, the distributions will have changed dramatically. Yeah. We, in, back in those days, we had relatively few species and the numbers have increased a lot. The numbers coming, the species coming into Britain have increased a lot because of climate change. The other thing is that we had probably a century and a half of loss of ponds and water bodies, things like farm ponds and old ponds. And then the last 20, 30 years, we've had a huge increase in creation of new ponds. Um, so things have improved. These give you some idea of the distribution of species. Brian Eversham has a, a local name again. Um, about the same era. So these will be way, way out of date now. 1996 that was produced. <laughs> Atlases. Um, there are all sorts of really good guides. If you want to just get an easy introduction, I would recommend the Field Study Council guide. Um, so I'll leave that out for you to have a look at. Christine thinks they're about £3.50. You can get them online. So have a look at those. The little guides, I'm sure you'll have some suggestion, suggestions as to guide. The field guide to dragonflies and damselflies, um, pretty well comprehensive. But bear in mind, all the distributional information will be completely uh, history now. This is one which Alistair is co-author of. 
brilliant little book by Sorby, one of their most recent um, natural history publications, Dragonflies of the Sheffield area. So if you want to know what you're likely to find, you simply turn to this and you look at the map and see where the dots are. Um, you can also see which things are, are maybe coming in and you might be able to you know, predict that they will be turning up. So, definitely worth acquiring. So, really important group, they are doable. You need to think about what they're doing in terms of what it means to your site and the difference between one just turning up and looking and one's actually egg laying or breeding. So if you're out, you want to be recording that sort of information. The sort of thing that you can do, um, like we said for some of the other groups, is you look at what the temperature is today on your device, you record it, you see what time it is, and then you go and look at the ponds and walk around. You may have a complete blank. That is useful information. Get it down, send it in to the group. Because if we are managing the site, if we're improving the site, we need baseline information. And if the baseline information is there's not an awful lot there, and in five years' time, people are recording it and find that there are more things, that is really useful. So don't assume that not finding stuff is actually of no importance. It is really important. And it may just be that you, you're not sure what it is you're looking at, but a large dragonfly a damselfly. That information is useful and you might be able to count however many damselflies you found. <coughs> um, if you don't get into species, that's not the end of the world. Just having that information is useful. And I would also assume that anything once we get people able to identify with a little bit more um, reliability, then you'll be interested in any records that are generated as well. Potentially. So, thank you very much. I'm going to hand over to Alistair because he is the one that you've come to hear uh, and he is the expert. So, we're going to start off by talking about what a dragonfly actually is. So, dragonflies are insects that belong to the order Odonata um, and they are an ancient lineage of insects. So, they started. Uh, they appeared in the fossil record around 300 million years ago in the Carboniferous um, and a lot of our rocks uh, locally are of that kind of age. So there are examples, as uh, Ian was saying, of uh, some really big dragonflies. Uh, we borrowed a fossil many, many years ago at the museum uh, called Waliala bolsoveri which was discovered in, uh, in Bolsover, as the name suggests, and its wings were, one wing was that long. Um, so these uh, were the apex flying animals um, around at that time. They would almost certainly have been predators as they are now. Um, and I, unlike Ian, would not have wanted to have been met one. Um, so the, the dragonflies are divided into these two suborders, um, at least in this country. There's a, actually a third suborder that I'm not going to talk about because you only get those on a few isolated islands um, around the world. Um, so these are the two groups that we get in the UK. The Zygoptera, are the damselflies, and the Anisoptera, or the true dragonflies. Um, I always find it extremely awkward that the Odonata are called dragonflies and the Anisoptera are also called dragonflies. Um, when I say dragonfly, I'm generally going to be referring to the order um, rather than the, the individuals. I'll try and stick to that formula, but I can't <laughs> make any promises. So one of the questions that we often get is what is the difference between a damselfly and a true dragonfly? Well, the damselflies in general, they're smaller. Their flight is more uh, weak, more fluttery. Um, but the big distinction, the most obvious thing is that damselflies, when they're at rest, they hold their wings over their backs, whilst true dragonflies hold their wings out side to side. Um, so there are always exceptions in zoology. Um, that's the, kind of the first rule. Uh, and we'll come to one of those later on. Uh, so, dragonflies are amphibious, 
they spend the vast majority of their life span in the water. They start off life as an egg. It's going to be, uh, the eggs are usually uh, laid into either floating pond weed uh, or down the sides of emergent vegetation, so uh, typha and, and reeds and that kind of thing. Those eggs hatch out uh, into a nymph. And uh, as has been mentioned, the nymphs are very much apex predators of the uh, aquatic insect ecosystem. And in some habitats, they can be the apex predator. Um, they will take small fish, things like stickleback, um, and they have these, this horrible weaponry in their mouth. Have you ever seen the film Aliens? Um, it's basically when the alien sticks its little mouth out of its mouth, that's where it got it from. That's where the idea came from. Um, they, they have these jaws that come out and grab and pull back in. Um, absolutely horrendous. <laughs> um, so when the, uh, the nymph will live in, in a pond or a river, uh, sometimes for up to 10 years, so they can get quite old. Um, and when they've gone through a succession of molts, that is shedding their skin, eventually uh, they'll make the decision to find a bit of vegetation that sticks out of the water They'll crawl their way up it, get about a foot above the water, and then they will emerge and they will become an adult, an imago. Um, and that adult basically has one function, to find a mate and then to lay some eggs. Job done. So when a dragonfly first emerges out of its uh, nymphal form, it's extremely vulnerable. Um, and so for that reason, they tend to do it overnight, um, so to try and avoid predation from birds. Um, it takes them quite a while to inflate their wings and to inflate their abdomen. But even after they've uh, inflated their wings, they can still continue to be vulnerable. In some dragonfly books, you might notice that the photographs have got really shiny wings, and that's because they're what we call teneral it means that they've just emerged and their wings have been inflated, but they haven't hardened yet. And the reason why the books feature these photographs is because whilst they're teneral, they're easy to catch. Um, they're also quite dopey, so they're much more likely to sit still, as this one has, uh, so they have their photograph taken. Um, the problem with teneral dragonflies is that their markings aren't always the same as the ones that you'll see uh, on the, in the adults. Uh, so that's something to bear in mind. So um, the amphibious life cycle of the dragonflies means that they tend to be found associated with water, uh, but not always. So when dragonflies first emerge, they'll undertake a, what's called a dispersal phase. So they'll fly off away from their mother pond um, and they'll go and find somewhere else to set up shop. Um, now, for some dragonflies, that can be literally from one side of the pond to the other. Um, or they might follow the, the path of the river. Or they might undertake a, a massive migration across the North Sea or the English Channel. So we get regular influxes of dragonflies coming in from the continent. Um, now, some of these species are ones that we're familiar with here, that breed here. Others are what we call vagrants that are just kind of passing through. Um, and they haven't yet started to, to actually breed here. Different species of dragonfly have different habitat requirements. So, so they will exist in, in different kinds of habitats. So uh, top uh, left there is uh, an upland pond, which is suitable for some species. Um, Others prefer um, upland streams that are quite fast flowing, rocky bottomed, uh, little rivulets, that kind of thing. Um, others prefer slow moving rivers with lots of vegetation floating on the surface. Um, others like still water, um, some are really sensitive to pollution um, or water, uh, oh, water oxygenation. Others prefer it stagnant and are not that bothered about um, horrible bits of pollution. So different species, different requirements. Um, another thing to mention about recording dragonflies is uh, if it's throwing it down with rain and it's really cloudy, don't bother um, because the adult dragonflies are not going to be on the wing. 
Um, now, I should mention that I am only really going to be talking about the uh, adult dragonflies because those are the ones that we generally see. Um, they're also um, they're easier to identify as well. The, the nymphs you need to really have under a microscope quite often to identify. So we're not going to cover those. Um, so yeah, you've got to be careful of the, of the weather. If it's cloudy, if it's rainy, if it's windy, don't bother. A nice sunny day is, uh, with still conditions is absolutely perfect. Um, even if it's a little bit cloudy but you get these bursts of sunshine, still good. Um, you can have a look out for dragonflies. So as I've mentioned, the main function of an adult dragonfly is to go out and find a mate. Um, now, the two different genders have two different uh, philosophies. Um, we'll start with the male philosophy, which is basically quantity over quality. Um, male, don't make any comparisons <laughs> with humans. Um, so male dragonflies are really looking for anything to mate with, um, to the extent that you can sometimes find male dragonflies latched onto other male dragonflies. Um, which is a little bit peculiar, but it does, uh, it does happen and it's not successful, needless to say. Um, so what male dragonflies do is, once they've undertaken their dispersal phase, they'll go and find themselves somewhere to set up a territory. Um, and that territory will usually be marked by features that it thinks the female will want to lay her eggs in. Uh, and what they're generally looking for are uh, bits of reeds sticking out of the water. Um, because, uh, as you can imagine, the nymphs need those reeds to be able to climb up to get out. So having a, a pond that is bereft of emergent vegetation is not going to be good habitat for dragonflies. Once a male dragonfly has found itself a nice bit of habitat, uh, it will protect it. Um, so some species will patrol. They'll have a set area that they'll just fly around constantly. Um, others will perch on a bit of vegetation and they will fly to investigate anything that they spot coming in. Dragonflies have incredible eyesight. Uh, those eyes often wrap are completely around the head and meet in the middle at the top. The head is all eye um, and what is an eye is mouth. Um, so they can see extremely well and they're very adept to spotting movement. Um, now the beauty of this means that uh, if you don't get a good view of a dragonfly um, whilst you're trying to identify it, wait, because it'll be back in a minute um, and you can get a decent view then. So if a male dragonfly detects uh, another male dragonfly uh, coming into its territory, it will go and attack it. And you can see these dog fights between dragonflies that are quite entertaining to watch. It's probably quite stressful for the insect itself. Um, but you'll often hear this sound of rattling wings. Um, and that's the two dragonflies trying to break each other's wings. Um, and whilst death is seldom caused, you do sometimes see damaged dragonflies that uh, are almost certainly uh, harmed from these dog fights, broken wings, bent abdomen, that kind of thing. Um, if a male dragonfly spots a female, it will go and investigate the female and then chase after it until it allows her, uh, him to mate. Uh, and mating is done, as you can see here, uh, the male has claspers on the back of its abdomen, which it then grabs behind the head of the female, and then the female, is, uh, uh, its abdomen then reaches up and grabs a sperm packet that the, uh, that the male has deposited on its uh, midriff. Um, now, female strategy is uh, very much quality over quantity. Uh, she only has a certain number of eggs, so she wants to make sure she's mating with the best male that she can find. And it may sound a little bit like that the female doesn't have much of an option as to who she gets to mate with. And to a certain extent, that's true. Uh, the female will fly away from the male. Um, and so for that, that's one way that she kind of makes sure that the male that's chasing after his, is fit. Um, but she has a sneaky trick up her sleeves. Um, if she isn't impressed by the male that has mated with her, she can eject the sperm packet. Um, <laughs> now, some males have um, gotten wise to this 
Uh, so these are a pair of damselflies making the same, so sometimes described as a heart shape, which sounds a lot more romantic than it actually is. Um, so some males, uh, they are, have got wise to this uh, sneaky female trick, and so they will keep hold of the female until she oviposits, until she lays her eggs, which is what's happen, happening here. And you can sometimes see damselflies and dragonflies flying around in what we call in tandem. So they're flying around like that, and they can feed, they can move around, they can do whatever they like, um, but the male is making sure that that female is only going to accept his genetic material, she's not going to mate with anything else. Um, other species of dragonfly uh, will guard the female. So you'll sometimes see a female flying around with a male hovering right above her. And again, that male is making sure that nothing else mates with that female until she gets desperate enough to start overpositing. In terms of equipment for recording dragonflies, step one, get yourself a decent pair of binoculars. Um, the temptation with binoculars is always to go and buy a pair where you can zoom in and see a gnat circling the moon. Um, not so with dragonflies. What you want is something that can focus quite close to you. Because quite often what you're going to be looking at are dragonflies on a bit of vegetation only a couple of meters away from you. Um, but you need to be able to get in to see those little tiny markings on the back of the abdomen. So that close focus is really important. Um, also, wide field of view, because sometimes you'll be looking at a dragonfly that is going zoom past you and you need to be able to focus in on it as it's in flight. Um, and if you've got something that's only got a, a field of view of about that much, you're not going to find the thing flying. Step number two, get yourself a decent um, field guide. I'm not going to recommend any specific field guide. This one's pretty good. Um, but anything that's illustrated by Richard Lewington is a good field guide. Uh, he does excellent insect illustrations. Um, the temptation with field guides is to get one that covers the whole of Europe. Don't. <laughs> Unless you're going recording in Europe, get one that just covers um, the British Isles. Because otherwise, what you'll end up doing is trying to record species that you only find in Europe and you're, you're writing into your local dragonfly recorder saying, oh, I've, I've found this as your dragonfly. Um, and that dragonfly recorder is going to say, well, you get them in Italy, um, what are you doing here? Uh, so just get one that covers the, uh, the British Isles. Um, and has has been uh, plugged already. Dragonflies of the Sheffield area, uh, published a couple of years ago, um, but it's still in date. Um, it, record, it shows all of the locally occurring species, um, a little bit of information about their distribution history, um, and most importantly, those distribution maps telling you where you can find them. And if you're going to do it properly, you need to get yourself a net. Uh, don't use a fishing net because you'll obliterate anything that you catch. Get yourself a, a proper entomological net, nice and lightweight. Um, Preferably something with a, either a telescopic handle uh, or an extendable handle because some of the dragonflies will be out of reach. Um, and if you're not careful, if you get yourself one that's got a handle that long, you'll be falling into the river, um, which we don't want. Okay, so we're going to now move on to our species list. So these are all the locally occurring uh, damselflies and I've grouped them uh, as according to how confusing they are with each other. Um, so we've got the banded demoiselle, the emerald damselfly, which are the, the two metallic greens that we get. The blue-tailed, the large red-eyed, and the small red-eyed. The common blue and the azure, and the large red. And for dragonflies, the list is a little bit longer. We've got the brown hawker, the emperor, the southern hawker, the migrant hawker, the hairy dragonfly, sometimes called the hairy hawker, uh, the common hawker, the golden ringed, the four spot chaser, the broad body chaser, the black tailed skimmer, the black darter, the ruddy darter, the common darter. Okay. Uh, so before we get on to how to identify them, I'm just going to quickly mention some uh, anatomical things. 
So dragonflies are insects, which means that their bodies are made up of a head, a thorax, and an abdomen. Uh, the abdomen is made up of several segments, and when I mention segment one, I'm talking about the bit that's nearest the thorax, and segment 10 is the, the end bit, the tail end. Um, you might also hear me mention the antihumeral region, which is this area here. Um, a lot of dragonflies have stripes in that area, and they're called antihumeral stripes or shoulder stripes uh, occasionally. And again, useful identification features. Finally, this dot here, this spot on the wing of some dragonflies is called a pterostigma, which is literally the wing spot. And it's different colors in different species. So again, quite a useful uh, little identification feature. So let's start with our two metallic green damselflies. Uh, so we have the banded demoiselle and the emerald damsel. Um, the banded demoiselle is definitely on the increase. Uh, so as has been mentioned, this is a species that only came into the area in the last 30 years. Um, now the reasons why uh, this species and many others have come in uh, a legion really it goes from improvements in water quality climate change um, as has been mentioned it more better and more habitat for them the banded demoiselle is allegedly a lowland species that likes clean slow moving water uh, with lots of uh, floating vegetation on the surface so why the hell has it been spotted on burbage brook <laughs> Um, it is everywhere. Uh, you can't move for them these days. They're, they're absolutely uh, everywhere. The emerald damselfly, on the other hand, is definitely on the decline. Uh, so this is uh, becoming more and more rare. So how can you tell the difference between the two? Well, for one thing, the banded demoiselle is huge. It's the largest species of damselfly that we get locally. Um, its flight is often described as fluttering, almost butterfly-like. Um, but the biggest and most obvious feature is that the male has these almost opaque wings with a very dark blue band across them. And the wings are hugely broad. Um, now, I, I learned this recently by watching a David Attenborough documentary, but apparently the males, and this is a male, um, they will perch and they will use those wings to signal I don't know what they're actually <laughs> signaling. Um, I saw a film of it, so it must be true. <laughs> I've never seen it myself, but um, it's David Attenborough. <laughs> what can you say? So um, in comparison, the uh, emerald damselfly is much smaller, much daintier, and its wings are narrow and completely transparent. Um, the green coloration as well also has little bits of blue on it in the male. The females um, of these are a little bit more tricky to tell apart but again as you can see the female banded demoiselle um, has these almost opaque wings it just lacks the banding. Um, now You'll see in a lot of books, and certainly when a lot of people talk about dragonfly identification, they'll focus on the males. Um, now, if you like, you can call that sexism, or it, it's also because you're more likely to see the males. When the males are guarding their territories, they don't give a hoot about anything else. Um, so they're, they're kind of vulnerable to predation. They're really just on the lookout for, for females. That's all they care about. Um, the females, on the other hand, tend to hide away a little bit more and they only become really visible uh, either when they're actually copulating with the, with the males or laying their eggs. There are some species of dragonfly that I've never seen uh, the females for except when they're laying their eggs. Um, so that's these two. Uh, let's move on to the next group, uh, which I've grouped together as blue tails. So the, the easiest is the blue-tailed damselfly. Um, that's easy to separate out from the large red-eyed damselfly and the small red-eyed damselfly by the fact that it doesn't have a red eye. 
Um, but uh, the other differences are that the, the blue-tailed damselfly is a, a much more dainty insect. The, the two red-eyed damselflies are quite chunky in comparison. If you ever see them together, you'll realise that there's no mistaking of the two. Um, but yeah, keep an eye out for, for these three species, but just bear in mind that if it hasn't got red eyes, then it's going to be a blue-tailed damselfly, Ischnura elegans. Um, you'll find blue-tailed damselflies on, well, pretty much everywhere, on, on any decent bit of, uh, of waterway. Um, they tend to prefer slower moving water or ponds. Uh, you'll find them in vegetation by the shoreline um, or sometimes in long grass in meadows uh, next to any watercourses. The two red-eyed damselflies are relatively new to the area and we've been watching these two species um, move their way up the country. Um, and they came in, I think the large red-eyed damselfly actually became established over at Treat and Dyke, um, over in the, uh, the east of, uh, of our region, um, just about five years ago, something like that. The small red-eyed damselfly uh, has only been established in the last three years or so. Um, now, how to tell these two apart? The large red-eyed and the small red-eyed damsel are very, very similar to each other. Uh, they both have a very annoying habit of sitting about a metre or two off of the shoreline, usually sitting on top of lily pads. So they're just out of net reach for a start, so you can't easily get them in your hand. Um, and they are very similar to each other. So what you're looking for um, is the amount of blue that there is. Now ignore the mites that you've got on the small red eye damselfly at the bottom there. Um, but you can see that there is blue going all the way along the underside of the abdomen. And there's a lot more blue at the end as well. Um, if you can see blue on the underside of that abdomen when you're looking at it through your binoculars, um, then you've got a small red eyed damselfly. Um, it's also often said that the small red eyed damsel has an upturned abdomen. Um, I think it has, but it's also a bit of an optical illusion because the blue, as you can see, slightly curves upwards. Um, the large red eyed damselfly, uh, in comparison, the, the black is pretty much all the way around. You can't see any blue from the side at all. The other thing to look for, uh, and this is um, something that I'm investigating at the moment, on the small red eyed damselfly, on the on the side of the thorax, I don't know where to best to stand. On the side of the thorax, there is a dot. Yeah? It is missing. The dot is not there on the large red eye. Are you saying that that's too small a feature to see? <laughs> no, if you, if you can get one of these in your hand, um, then you'll be able to see it. Um, I should mention that uh, I think for, for if you're going to record dragonflies properly, going on uh, uh, some field walks with recorders is really important because you can be shown how to catch them, how to hold them. Um, I can tell you how to do that, but showing you is a lot, is a lot easier. I mean, basically with, with damselflies, um, they're so small, you've, you've got to hold onto their legs um, as you're looking at them. Um, the problem is, is if you only get one leg it's going to leave it behind um, so you need to make sure that you get at least two preferably three legs on one side um, but yeah they it doesn't hurt them at all and then you release them and off they go um, now being a museum of course we we collect specimens um, i don't tend to take dragonflies uh, and that's partly because they don't retain their color um, when, you, when you pin them, um, aside from the fact that I don't like, particularly like killing these things anyway. Um, if you want to get a permanent record of them, a photograph will do. Okay? Um, now that little dot is not necessarily diagnostic. Um, so diagnostic is a feature that is um, common across all the entire species. Yeah? Um, that little dot doesn't appear in every individual small red-eyed damselfly, but it seems to locally. So we've probably got quite a, a small 
inbred population going on in Sheffield. Um, so that little dot does seem to appear on all, most of our small red eyes. Okay. Our next species group, I'm going to call the blues. And these are the two that people confuse more than anything else. We get loads of records of people saying, oh, I found a common blue damselfly. And I look at the photograph and I say, no, it isn't. It's an azure damselfly and vice versa. Um, the two are very similar indeed. Um, but once you get your eye in, once you've seen a few as you've been walking along um, and verified their identification by looking closely at them, uh, then you can start to tell them apart on the wing. They're slightly different colours. So one of the best identification features, um, you're going to laugh at this again, aren't you? Uh, <laughs> it's that line on the thorax. Okay? It's often called the Sanagrian spur, and you won't find it on the common blue damselfly. It's unique um, in, this two, in these two species to the azure. So that's what you're looking out for. So that's, that's a nice, easy way of identifying them from the side. Well, once you've got, honestly, once you've got them in your hand, that's easy. <laughs> the other marking that you're looking for is this. Um, and there are a couple of specimens over on the table uh, where you'll be able to see this. Um, in the common blue damselfly, uh, on the uh, second segment of the abdomen, you have a line with a ball on it, sometimes called a lollipop. Um, on the azure damselfly, it looks more like a wine goblet, or, as I prefer, a pair of rabbit ears. Um, this little line here is sometimes missing um, on the azure. So you've just got a kind of floating goblet there, uh, but it's still an azure. So that's the male. The females uh, of these, well, you'll still see that Sanagrian spur on the azure, on the female azure damselfly. So that's still there. Uh, but the markings on the abdomen are a lot more black on the azure Whereas on the common blue, it's often described as they're rocket ships making their way up the abdomen. Um, now you're probably looking at that and thinking, but that common blue damselfly is green. Surely that's easy to tell apart from the azure damselfly. Well, colour is a very dangerous guide in dragonflies. We tend not to try not to um, identify things by their colour because the colour is slightly variable. Um, so this is the green form of the common blue. There is also a blue form of the common blue um, you tend, in, tend to find in females. So look at the markings. Ignore the colour, just look at the markings. Okay, And that's true of a lot of species. Um, the colour change is thought to be caused by the water temperature that the nymph was living in. Um, and we're finding this with a lot of different species. Drag uh, butterflies are the same. When you get different morphs of butterflies, it's supposed to be the, the temperature of the, uh, of the uh, chrysalis as it's, uh, before it emerges that causes the variation. Um, so yeah, those are the common blue and the azure. They are straightforward to identify once you've got them in your hand. Okay. All right, this one's a lot easier. <laughs> so this is the large red damselfly. Um, it's red. <laughs> so I've, I've literally just got through saying, ignore color because it's really variable. This one is, is bright red. It's uh, pretty much always bright red. Uh, and there's nothing else quite like it locally. Um, the only thing that we ever get recorded around here um, that somebody that people confuse is the small red damselfly um, but the small red damsel you don't get round here it's very much as, uh, restricted to the south which is not to say that we won't get it eventually it might make its way up but it certainly doesn't seem to be showing any signs of doing it yet um, the other nice thing about the large red damselfly is it's the herald of the dragonfly recording season 
So you get these coming out really quite early on, uh, as early as April um, and into May. Uh, and they'll stick around for a, for a few months. Um, so yeah, it's a lovely little damselfly that, okay? On to the true dragonflies now. Uh, this one we're going to start with is really straightforward. It's called the brown hawker. Uh, it tends to be a dragonfly that you find um, on rivers, canals, uh, but they will quite happily um, disperse quite a long way away from the water. So uh, we've recorded uh, these kinds of things several miles away from any water sources. Um, it's most similar to other hawker dragonflies. Um, the females of those hawkers are also a little bit brown, but they're nowhere near as brown as this. Most importantly, this has got brown wings. And you can see those brown wings in flight. Um, so if we uh, go onto the sheaf, uh, you may well see this species knocking about. Um, and yeah, when, you, when it flies past, which it will do quite quickly, all you do is you get a sense of brown. Um, as it goes. So it's a fairly easy one to, uh, to record. Um, they do sometimes swarm as well. So I went onto the, um, onto the canal in Sheffield, uh, the Tinsley Canal, and there was a swarm of these, so about 300 individual insects flying around. Um, it, was, it was amazing to see and slightly terrifying because the, the sound that they make is incredible. On to the next two. So we're gonna call these the, the apple green dragonflies. So what we're looking at here is a female emperor. You can tell it's a female because it's sticking its back end into the water, it's laying eggs. Um, and we have the female southern hawker. And both of those are, have this lovely apple green color, um, which you can readily see in flight. But you'll also notice that the uh, female emperor is a lot more green. There's very little brown on it. Um, if you see an apple green dragonfly, you need to get your binoculars on it to make sure that it's, uh, uh, whether it's an emperor or a southern hawker. The southern hawker has a nice bit of jizz. Um, it's a very inquisitive dragonfly. And if you see one on a pond, it will come and have a look at you and they do hover in front of your face and then fly away on their way. Yeah. The other thing about the emperor is that it's officially it's our biggest species of dragonfly. Um, that's mostly because its, its abdomen is quite long. So when you see it in flight, it has a droopy bottom. Um, as it flies along, you see that the abdomen slightly droops down um, because it's really long. The male emperor is not apple green, it's blue. It's very blue. So when you're uh, seeing a, a dragonfly that looks extremely blue, it's probably what you've got. The male southern hawker, on the other hand, still has this apple green coloration, but it's blue on the tip of its abdomen. Um, so in flight, it looks like it's got a blue tail. And that by an optical illusion, that blue tail looks a little bit bulbous. In reality, it's not. Pardon me. Um, <laughs> so as, you're, as you recognize that in flight, uh, you'll, note, you'll spot that blue end quite uh, distinctively. On to the rest of the hawkers. So we have the, the common hawker, the migrant hawker, and the hairy hawker. Uh, three very similar looking dragonflies. We're going to start with the hairy hawker because of the three that's the easiest to spot for various reasons. So as the name suggests, it is hairy. Um, the hair covers its thorax and runs all the way down the sides of its abdomen. Um, now it's a small dragonfly so it's much smaller than the, the uh, other two hawkers but it comes out in May and it sticks around until back end of June, maybe the beginning of July, and then that's it. 
its season is finished. The other two hawkers, they start in mid-July. So if you find, if you see there's a hawker dragonfly that looks brown and bluey flying around, um, quite stubby as it's flying, that's probably a hairy hawker. Um, now this is a species that we were recording at Potterick Carr for easy 20 years. Um, it had only just come into the area and it stopped there and it has been there ever since and every year we'd get more records of the hairy hawker um, and we looked around the, the dern to see if it was uh, coming down into uh, more towards the Sheffield area and it didn't until we started writing that book and getting it ready for publication <laughs> at which point it's exploded um, it's now been recorded at Old Moor on the Dern and just to add insult to injury it started coming up from the south as well so it's now been recorded as far as Pebbly Pond um, so it's, uh, it's a dragonfly that is very much coming into the area um, and yeah we want records of it um, nice easy one to record because it's the first true dragonfly that we get flying in the season the only thing that you could possibly mistake it for is an emperor because they overlap emperors come around uh, come out around june time um, but the emperor is easily twice the size uh, of the hairy hawker so not that difficult to distinguish the migrant hawker is one that you're going to have to get in your hand again um, so the distinctive characteristic of the migrant hawker is that marking at the top of its abdomen. It looks like a golf tee. Um, it shares that feature with the southern hawker, um, but the southern hawker's apple green, so you're not going to mistake the two. Okay. The common hawker is a dragonfly of, the, of upland, uh, sometimes called the moorland hawker. Um, they can't see it particularly well, the contrast isn't great, but one of its distinctive features is that it has a very narrow waist about here. You may laugh. <laughs> if you see it uh, sat like this and you get it through your binoculars, it's really distinctive. Um, the other feature, now you, if you laughed at that, you're going to think this is hilarious. Um, the other feature that it has is what they call a yellow costa. So that, that leading edge of its front wings is called the costa, and it's yellow. And you can actually see that in flight. It's really distinct in that term. Um, um, now, dragonflies, you may think that dragonflies are flying along, flapping their wings all the time. They don't, they glide quite a lot of the time. So if you can get focus on, with your binoculars, um, you'll see that it has this yellow line going across that leading edge of the wing. Um, but I acknowledge that the, those two hawkers, the common hawker and the migrant hawker, difficult to separate. Unlike this one, um, this is the golden ring dragonfly. Um, a dragonfly very much of Upland. Um, that is Burbage Bridge, yeah, exactly. Uh, um, so yeah, you get those uh, on any little rivulets uh, quite high up. Um, there are two main populations that we get in the area. So we've got this lot mob off of uh, Burbage Bridge that's going into Wyming Brook and all that kind of area. And there's another mob over at Agden, so in the north of, of our area, um, where they've been recorded as well. And they do seem to be doing very well. They do seem to be expanding their range a little bit. Um, but they're enormous dragonflies. Uh, and they, they're black with these yellow rings, yellow hoops going around the abdomen, uh, unlike pretty much anything else, because they're, they're pretty big. They do have this club tail as well, uh, quite a bulbous back end. Um, so they're, yeah, they're pretty distinctive. Um, uh, right, this group's fun. <laughs> so these are the, oh, I've got a group, these is the chasers. Uh, so we have the broad-bodied chaser, the four-spot chaser, and the black-tailed skimmer. Um, we'll start off with, I think, the, um, the broad-bodied chaser. So as the name suggests, its, thor its uh, abdomen is quite wide. Uh, this photograph, uh, that abdomen's quite narrow 
for the species. I've seen ones with much more bulbous back ends. When you see them in flight, um, you get the sense of, of blue as they're flying around. Now, they're not the same as emperors. So when emperors are flying around, which are also very blue, um, their flight is a lot more relaxed. They're, that's one of the reasons I'm sure why they're called emperors, because they're kind of just mm, lying past. <laughs> it's almost like they're, they're doing that as they, as they go. These are more manic. <laughs> they're extremely territorial dragonflies. Um, so what they tend to do is perch on a bit of vegetation uh, and they'll sit there until they spot something coming into their territory and then they'll go and investigate it. They'll do whatever they're doing and then they'll come back. So this is very much a species that if you don't catch, uh, catch it or catch it in your binoculars, just wait, it'll be back and it'll very much perch again for you to get a decent look at. So what you're looking for to separate it from the black-tailed skimmer is the markings on the wing. The skimmer has completely clear wings, whereas the chaser has these black markings near the body. As I said before, the, the broad body, the abdomen, is uh, quite bulbous in the broad body chaser. And the black-tailed skimmer has a black tail. Not very easy to spot when it's in flight, it has to be said. Um, you'll also find that the, some broad body chasers do have a little bit of black on the tip of their abdomen, but it's not as extensive as you'll find on the black-tailed skimmer. So my advice would be to uh, check out the wings, wait until it perches, get your binoculars on it, um, and, and have a close look at it. You can catch them. I once caught two with one sweep. <laughs> I was very proud of myself that day. <laughs> um, now, the four-spot chaser, um, at first glance, it looks very much different to the, to the other two, um, but it's easily confused with the female of the broad-bodied chaser and the black-tailed skimmer. Um, the female of the four-spot chaser is pretty much the same as the, as the male. So, what you're looking for here are the four spots on the wings. Don't ask me why they called it the four spot chaser because each wing has two spots on it. Um, all of the wings put together have eight spots. <laughs> so who thought that four spot chaser would be a good idea? I don't know. Um, again, wait until it lands and then get a, a good look at its wings. And if it's got, each wing should have two dots on it. Um, one in the normal place where the pterostigma is and the other at the kind of what we call the elbow joint of the wing um, halfway up. Um, easy to spot. Uh, again, once you get your eye in, you can spot four spot chasers on the wing um, because even as the wings are beating, you can see those, those dots. They kind of leap out. Okay, our final grouping are the darters. So we have uh, three species that we'll get locally. Um, we'll start with the nice easy one, the black darter. Um, the black darter's black. <laughs> so the other two species of darter are, uh, are kind of, they're kind of red. So they're relatively easy to separate out. Um, the common darter and the ruddy darter are much more difficult to separate. So one identification feature that you'll see in all of the books uh, is that the uh, common darter has quite a straight abdomen. It's, uh, it's, it's pretty much parallel sided all the way down whilst the ruddy darter has a bulbous end of the abdomen. You can just kind of see it on that photograph from the side. Um, but if you see them from above, actually the distinction can be a little bit tricky. I certainly find it tricky. Um, so that's probably not the best feature to use. I mean, it's all right at a pinch if you get a, a fleeting glimpse. The other thing that they say about the ruddy data is it's a much more red colour than the uh, common data, much more vibrant red. Um, hence why the scientific name is Sympetrum sanguineum, which actually would translate as the bloody data, which I think is a much better name, but for some reason we go with ruddy data. But the best identification feature is one that you'll need to, you'll need to have it in your hand to use. But if you look at the legs, 
the legs of the ruddy data are entirely black, whilst the legs of the common data have a yellow stripe going uh, down their length. Um, and again, you can spot that with a pair of binoculars if need be, um, or you can, as I say, catch it in a net and have a closer look. Um, and yeah, as I say, the, the male black data is black, so that's nice and straightforward. Then you get the females. Uh, and the females all look the same as each other. They're all, they're all yellow uh, with bits of black on them. Uh, so the female black data is slightly more black than the other two species, but the diagnostic feature is these yellow spots on the thorax. Boop, boop, boop. Um, if you see a, a female data with those black spots, then it's a, a black data. Um, the best feature, I think, for identifying, uh, distinguishing the common data from the ruddy data is, again, that yellow stripe on the leg. So ye that yellow stripe on the leg is definitely the feature to uh, remember about the data. Okay. So when it comes to recording dragonflies, um, a lot of recording societies are moving to using iRecord now, uh, which I don't know if you've been introduced to that before, um, but it's, uh, it's a really good system and it allows you to input all of your data. You can input groups of data or record um, several species for one place very, very quickly. Um, it allows you to pinpoint exactly where you were and um, best of all, all of, the all of the records that you put in are vouched. They're verified by your local Dragonfly recorder. So if you input something into this, at the end of the Dragonfly recording season, I go onto the system and I verify all of the records. So it's very useful if you've got photographs. Um, so uh, when you do take a photograph of a Dragonfly, um, and you want to submit it onto iRecord, if you can take a photograph from the top and take a photograph from the side, that'll make sure that you get all of the identification features. Um, so yeah, do submit your records using iRecord. Um, and as Ian says, even if you're not certain what it is, if you've got a photograph, then an expert will look at it um, and they'll uh, verify what its identification is. But once the local recorder gets an idea of um, who you are and your level of expertise, then they will just tick the records as they go on, uh, which is, makes my life a lot easier. Uh, is it an app? Yes, so you can get this by going on to www.irecord.org.uk or if you've got a smartphone, uh, go on to the uh, app store uh, and you can download the app. Um, it's really good from your phone if you've got a smartphone because you can literally just, it'll pick up where you are automatically. You can take a photograph of it, upload it all really quickly. It's, uh, it's quite a, a, a good app. Um, and yes, I can certainly recommend using this. There are a couple of other recording apps out there, but this is the main one. This is, I think, where pretty much everything is, is feeding into now. Um, when you put something into iRecord, it's verified by a, um, an expert, and then that record will go to the National Biodiversity Network Atlas. So it then inputs into the National Recording Scheme um, and then people can download the, the records. So it's, it's, it's all the data is open source, so uh, anybody can get to it. It's really good. Yeah, yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>